Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome along to DBA Fundamentals Down Under uh, for this month's session in November. My name is Warwick Rudd, and I'm your host for this month's session. In today's session, we've got Jimmy May talking to us about SQL Server 2016, always on availability groups, enhancements. So before I hand over to Jimmy, there's just a couple of uh, housekeeping that I want to run through. First off, we want to call out to our, uh, our sponsor, Century One. They have some fantastic uh, articles, videos, downloads, ebooks, demos, etc., on their website that uh, will be um, of great value to you. So make sure you visit their, their site, download their stuff, have a look, and uh, use their products. What else have we got for this afternoon? We've got uh, today's session. It is being recorded. Once the session has been completed, it will be placed up onto the meeting archive as well as uh, onto the YouTube channel that uh, you will be able to review this session uh, at any stage. Now, we also have, um, because this is part of PASS, make sure that uh, you stay involved with PASS. There are, this is one of many virtual chapters. Go along to PASS. You can have a look at uh, all of those virtual chapters, sign in and uh, learn from the various past chapters that are available. So with that, I'll now hand over to uh, Jimmy and uh, we'll get this uh, session running. Okay, can you see my uh, screen over there? Uh, have you accepted? Yes. There we go. Yes, we can. Good. Okay, first of all, thanks, Warwick. And let's start out this presentation with a quiz. What are you seeing on, on that screen? People are noodling, what could it be? These are global warming protesters. And with that bit of levity, let's start to get the sh real show on the road. Uh, first of all, hey, thanks uh, very much for inviting me, Warwick. Great to uh, uh, chat with you again. I last uh, presented here about a year and a half ago. And uh, I noticed that last month, I've got some big shoes to fill, Brent presented. So uh, uh, let's see if I can uh, not top him, but at least match his uh, his. Uh, presentation. And uh, let me interject, I work for a company uh, that does storage. This, this presentation is not an ad. It is littered with all kinds of great internals and performance information. However, just be aware from time to time I may mention uh, uh, my, the products that we used to do this work. And hey, I heard there's an earth, there was an earthquake down there recently. I, I don't know whether anyone on this call was impacted, uh, but best wishes. And um, Let's just get it, let's get rolling. Um, we're going to talk about availability groups today, particularly some performance, some internals, and a whole bunch of lessons learned. And I have some uh, stuff to get out of the way first as well, some bookkeeping. A little bit about me, uh, cut to the chase here. I worked for SQL Cat for a while, ran the lab there. Boy, what a blast that was. And I'm an NCM, which I believe Warwick is as well. And in fact, I'm sure he is. And now I work. My company, Fusion IO, I was at Microsoft for nearly a decade. Um, I jumped ship to Fusion IO about, uh, about a year and a half ago. And uh, SanDisk acquired us. And now Western Digital has acquired SanDisk. Uh, my uh, CEO has given us strict orders, literally, seriously, in, a, in an, an initial conference call. We are not to use the term spinning rust. <laughs> and I am not kidding. <laughs> so you won't hear that term today. Um, I work specifically at a place called uh, the Data Propulsion Lab. Uh, this is uh, the home, home of uh, what was Fusion I.O. And uh, we flip the faster bit there every day. Uh, the SQL Server.exe slash faster is a, uh, uh, used to be the meme on my MSDN blog. And one of my readers actually, uh, uh, stop me if you've heard this before, it's a true story, uh, wrote me and said, dude, my, uh, my server won't start now. And I had to explain to him that the faster bit is an enterprise-only feature. OK, um, one last thing before we get rolling. This deck is, uh, gosh, uh, many dozens of slides. And um, if you feel free to contact me directly to get the deck, happy to send you the raw version. And uh, the worst that can happen if, if, if I give, it, give my deck away is that someone will plagiarize it. And if that's the worst that can happen, we're all in good shape, I hope. Uh, but you see, we can collapse the deck and turn it into sections, and you can click through and find the section that you want. It's a pretty cool, easy-to-use feature in PowerPoint if you're not aware of it. And again, ping me directly if you'd like the raw deck. Um, lots to get through today. We may not get through all of this. This is a 
basically a 90-minute presentation. And in fact, I am uh, presenting it next Saturday at SQL Saturday, Salt Lake City. Uh, looking forward to that. But we'll get through the important stuff. Uh, and lastly, we just published a white paper on which all the information that I'm presenting here and more is in. Uh, this, this white paper, of course, is designed to sell <laughs> SanDisk Flash. But be clear, I made it as a, uh, as a thought leadership exercise and included all kinds of, uh, well, the internals, the stuff you're going to see today, and including some tips and tricks that I'm sure you've never heard or most of you haven't heard of. And I would like to thank Warwick. He was one of the intrepid souls who gave this a cover-to-cover -cover, uh, pre-publication review. So thank you very much, Warwick. I uh, very much appreciate that. And I'll have this slide at the end of the deck as well. OK, let's talk about the architecture of this uh, thing. Uh, pretty vanilla uh, availability group exercise. This, this presentation assumes you guys know basically what an availability group is. There's no. Uh, uh, just don't have time to go through um, the uh, uh, the fundamentals of availability groups, uh, but we, this was comprised of three servers, uh, two U a piece, and that's about the thickness of two pizza boxes for those of you who aren't hardware geeks. And believe me, for a long time, even as a Microsoft consultant, I was not a hardware geek. I, uh, they parachuted me into the SQL Cat Lab to manage it, when I had never even uh, run a run Fiber or create Carbonato LUN. <laughs> so you don't need to know uh, a lot about hardware to be a successful uh, database professional. Um, what's remarkable about these boxes, these are from HP, as you can see, is that uh, they're, they're so much more powerful than they were just, just a few years ago. When I was running a lab about five years ago, uh, we needed four sockets, four U boxes to approach the kind of performance that we're going to get out of these boxes. And as you can see from the bottom image, uh, this, this 2U, basically commodity server, um, very affordable, as you'll see later on, can hold up to 24, 24 two and a half inch disks, and that's 30 terabytes of raw storage. Uh, if you if you if you populate these with SSD, not just our SSD, any of our competitors, uh, um, it's it's pretty pretty amazing stuff. What you can do with just a two U box today. And here are the stars of the show. Again, don't want this to be an advertisement, but let me just say that a drive like this today can put out not just our again, not just SanDisk Flash, but our competitors' flash. The point of the point is we use this flash in this reference architecture, this uh, um, for this work. But any contemporary flash, uh, one disk, one of these SSDs you hold in your hand, throws out more IOPS than a full-blown SAN. It's, it's pretty darn impressive what contemporary storage can do. So folks, this stuff is game changers. Uh, Flash is a game changer for so many applications. The, the real great thing about this uh, stuff is it moves the bottleneck, the I.O. bottleneck, from storage, where it has been historically, to the CPU where it belongs. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, again, a very vanilla architecture. I got it. We had a load injector. We had uh, three servers. Three, pri three replicas, one primary, two secondaries, and uh, we had an 80 gigabit throughput, uh, by, and we achieved 80 gigabit by teaming 40 gigabit NICs. And uh, now, finally, after the preamble and what I hoped wasn't too much of an ad, <laughs> we're, we're going to dive right into some internals. And this is the fun part for me. This is a slide I actually got from Microsoft, and then I, I meant to put the Microsoft logo on here. My friend La Ross Laforte of the... Uh, Chicago MTC shared the slide with me. Always on availability groups, have, there are two components of it that are pretty important uh, uh, in terms of availability groups. And there were two bottlenecks in the legacy code from database mirroring from way back when, and of course, which still exists and is marked for deprecation, but is available to us. But uh, the legacy database mirroring code uh, was uh, the basis on which availability groups was built. And, and back in 2012, when availability groups were introduced, as well as in 2014, there were a couple of bottlenecks uh, that uh, they didn't get, they didn't, um, they needed some work. One of them was the load transport. Very, very important piece here. Uh, this is simply the process, as you can see here, that encrypts and compresses the log traffic and sends it across the wire to secondary replicas. Folks, this was the bottleneck. We couldn't get, uh, as you will see in the slide pretty soon, not much more than 50 megabytes per second across the wire. And there are a lot of applications that generate more than 50 megabytes per second. And um, uh, even if your application doesn't, your maintenance might. 
And the challenge here was that if you're, the log traffic you were generating got to that threshold, and it doesn't matter how big your hardware is, it was a hardwired threshold uh, in terms of a, um, it's this being a bottleneck. Well, that that data, that log, was hard was hardened on the primary, but it was queued on the primary and couldn't get across the wire to the secondary. So if that primary failed, you're hosed. And if you have readable secondaries enabled, for example, that data wasn't available until it until it got across the wire, for example. Um, so there were there are some challenges that this bottleneck in 2012 and 2014 uh, gave us. We uh, lobbied heavily. Now, when I say we, not just myself as a as a an employee today of a flash manufacturer. Back when I was on SQL Cat, when we first discovered this bottleneck, um, we were we lobbied with the product product team. It was a hard problem to solve, and in 2016 they did it. So we can be grateful to them. Uh, but let's move from the log transport to the uh, other bottleneck. This is the redo process. Uh, you can think of the redo, this is the, when the once the data does get to the secondary, it's got to be secondary, it's received by the log, hardened on the secondary log, and then it's applied, redone, to the uh, readability group databases on the secondary replicas. You can think about redo simply as a continuous restore thread that, uh, that applies the changes made on the primary replica to the secondary replica databases. Okay, so there's two important concepts, log transport and redo. And we'll be talking about those uh, uh, in a non-trivial fashion as we, we uh, walk through the deck. And, uh, oh, let's talk about some performance. Yeah, this is pretty exciting. I need to emphasize, and this, this is 2014 versus 2016. I just told you that the log transport was a legacy bottleneck and inherited from the DB mirroring base code. Um, it existed in SQL Server 2012, existed in SQL Server 2014 AGs. And uh, we're going to look and see what happened. Happened in the 2016, the product group did a really great job. I need to emphasize here, as you can see here, the blue bars represent SQL 2014, the red bars represent SQL 2016. And I need to emphasize the very same hardware was used for this testing. The only difference in this test protocol is the version of SQL Server. 2014 versus 2016. And this experiment demonstrates one of the most exciting outcomes of the work that the product team provided for us in 2016. Uh, so you, as you can see from these two pieces of the chart, CPU increased by about a factor of four, business transactions increased by about a factor of six. And so uh, here were the, here's where the improvements are. The transfer to the secondary you can easily see the bottleneck I'm talking about here. Look at before we were stuck at, um, and again, this is Hecaton, 100, 100, 104 uh, megabytes per second. In 2016, we're getting a half of a gigabyte across the wire. And folks, not very much special tuning was required to do this. We installed the hardware, we installed SQL Server, we ran our, our benchmarking tool, and it was just basically as simple as that. And as you can see in the very, very last uh, uh, pair of bars there, the, the bytes sent to transport was about half of a gig out in 2016. And likewise, log bytes received was almost, almost the same in this, this test, 498 megabytes per second, basically a half a gig per second. In other words, the bytes sent across the wire were received and hardened on the log in basically real time. The log transport bottleneck in 2016 has been, been, been eliminated. And folks, this is very, very exciting for those of us doing high performance database work. So um, um, let's talk about this in terms of storage just very quickly here. Uh, this slide is duplicated here. Did I, uh, I may have hit the wrong button. We saw this slide. Ah, here we go. Here is uh, what we saw before with Hecaton, as I mentioned. And now let's look at the throughput results uh, for the conventional engine. I mentioned 50 megabytes per second uh, that the conventional engine could do. And we see it here, pretty consistent, bottlenecked, uh, couldn't get past it, no matter how much hardware we threw at it. Whereas by installing 2016, 
and uh, this again, this is Don Hecaton, this is a conventional engine, this is the, the SQL Server we generally know and love, because not too many of us are using Hecaton in production yet. Uh, we're getting a quarter gigabyte ac across the wire. So just, again, same hardware, just different versions of SQL Server. We increased log transport performance by a factor of five. And uh, uh, be, be aware of something, again, this is not an ad. But if you don't have storage that can accommodate this kind of throughput, you're going to be bottlenecked on I/O still. So it's pretty important you uh, have your. If you need performance like this, you have the storage, the CPU, the other relevant hardware components to match. Okay. Now, having seen those uh, the log transport bottleneck and how it's been mitigated thanks to the great work of the SQL Server product team. Let's dive into some testing with regard to that specific architecture, the three servers that I showed you a moment ago. Um, what One of the key takeaways here is, without diving into, I'm not going to walk through each one of these counters one by one. You can see for yourselves. I've got highlighted processor time. That's a very important counter, of course. Look at the consistency Across across the board here, with uh, by by use by intelligent use of flash, and these and we only use by the way ten SSDs, ten two and a half inch SSDs in this architecture. Uh, we are able to sustain eighty percent average CPU across uh, consistently, and every other important metric here was consistent. Transactions per second, seventy one thousand. This is two replicas, or excuse me two secondaries, three replicas altogether, including the primary, in full sync commit mode, of course, AGs require that. Uh, AGs require full recovery, and in our case, we were in uh, a synch synchronous commit mode. Uh, transactions permitted here in this crazy um, performance was over 4 million per minute. Aren't too many of us have applications that need that. Uh, log bytes flushed, this is from the primary, over 200 megabytes per second. And um, bytes sent to the transport, 400, over 400 megabytes per second. Why was it twice? Because we have two secondaries. And, and the way that Perfmon reports this, it reports every stream. This is a sum of every stream across the wire. So if you have one secondary, uh, this, would, this would match the log bytes flushed per second. Since we had two secondaries, we had a value that's approximately double. Okay, pretty high performance, pretty cool. All right, this is a recapsulation of the numbers you saw on the previous chart. Here now I've exposed I.O. And um, I've circled some things here. Those of us um, who do a little bit of I.O. tuning know about latency, the single unequivocally most important discounter there is. Uh, so we're taking a little, another look at these numbers from the previous page. And again, as I mentioned, we have 10 SSDs, six data disks, four log disks, and both of those were, were configured as RAID 10. And folks, even on flash, as our experiments show, and I'm not going to go into the specific evidence to justify this, but even on flash, because of the sensitivity uh, of the log, log file to latency, we had to segregate the log from the data. Um, so look at the total, the total throughput here we were getting, that's internal amongst the server itself was about a gigabyte per second. This isn't across the wire, this is just on a server. And uh, IOPS, 59,000, trying to get that with spitting media. Uh, not a crazy number, it's a, not, a lot of applications can uh, generate 60,000 IOPS. But uh, I want to point out the latency here, and we're going to dive into the latency for both the data and log files in the next couple of slides. Pretty impressive. I'm used to flipping the faster bit. Um, but I was amazed at the performance we got. As I mentioned, latency is unequivocally the single most important discounter. And historically, those of us on conventional SANS, and uh, boy, uh, I've, lived, I've, lived, I've lived through that world where we're struggling to get five or 10 milliseconds for our high performance apps. Pretty tough sometimes. Uh, doable under the right circumstances if, you're cooper if you have a SAN administrator that's cooperative and you have uh, uh, the appropriate number of spindles and uh, good teamwork great architecture, you can achieve 5 to 10 milliseconds of latency with conventional media. Um, but zero milliseconds latency was something even on flash that I really wasn't used to seeing. 
And uh, at first, when I got these results, I thought uh, something was broken. I had, it was missing counters or, or something. Um, I was scratching my head and noodling for about an hour until I finally figured it out. And uh, so let's move to the next slide and talk about that. Um, so to expose latency, I did something with the latency counter that I do in a lot of other counters, but never had to do do this trick, little trick before with the latency counters. I simply changed the scale in Perfmon from the default one that has been the default for latency since the beginning of time, and I changed it from one to ten thousand, and that exposed the latency values on the chart in a way that was usable. And as you can see here, generating about a gigabyte per second internally, you know, on the primary, I'm generating about a gigabyte of the data of I/O. All, not all of it's pushed across the wire. This is just this is data and log traffic on the server itself. Uh, random I/O. I'm getting 400 microseconds of latency. Folks, that that kind of uh, that kind of performance is not something I'm used to seeing, and I was pretty impressed with, with uh, the ability to do that. And uh, similarly, on log latency. Again, this is a separate volume. Uh, this is sequential I/O, not random. I'm getting about, a, I'm generating about a quarter of a gigabyte per second, 200 gigabytes per second, or megabytes per second. Let me rephrase that to make sure that it's clear. I was generating approximately a quarter gigabyte a second, maybe 200 megabytes a second, of sequential I/O on the log volume. And folks, this stuff is transferred across the wire. Log traffic is captured and sent across the wire. And uh, yeah, sequential I/O is easier to service, but I'm getting that at a consistent 200 microseconds of latency. Um, I know some of you out there struggle with struggle with this, and uh, uh, we all did in our in our DBA and consulting careers. Pretty neat stuff to be able to generate this kind of data with just a handful of flash. And uh, with that, I hope everyone was uh, duly and appropriately impressed. <laughs> I wasn't. Again, this is not an ad for Thandisk. This is just SQL Server 2016 implemented on an appropriately architectured Flash architecture, Flash environment. And uh, those are the kind of values we can get. And this, yeah, sure, this was a test environment, but these are the kinds of numbers you can get in the real world. Okay, I mentioned that, that was, uh, we talked about log transport, we talked about performance on Flash. Um, now let's talk about log redo a little bit. I mentioned, I mentioned uh, log redo was one of the bottlenecks, both in SQL Server 2012 and 2014. We talked about how log transport was so substantially improved, getting the bits from the primary to the secondary. Once it's on the secondary, the redo process kicks in. And again, as I said, this is the process that it's basically a continuous restore process. Uh, the team did work, do some work on this. It's better. But uh, there's still room for improvement, and I have this see me for additional details because normally during a presentation I don't talk about this. Uh, but lucky you, I unhid my slides, and we're going to dive into them. So let's walk through this. Uh, I want to make sure that you guys get this, so I'm going to do it as slowly as I can. Um, let me rephrase that, as coherently as I can to make sure that I present the uh, um, concepts coherently. So first of all, we're going to compare the, the CPU on the primary to the secondary. And as you can see on the primary, we had 89% CPU. The thing's uh, uh, working pretty darn hard. We're getting our money's worth for the licenses that we pay so much for. But the secondary, you know, it's on the primary, we're doing a lot of work. We're doing transactions, servicing the workload, et cetera. On the secondary, all we're doing is applying the redo. The redo process is the work. So not n this, the secondary doesn't have to work nearly as hard to apply the log traffic that's sent to it across the wire. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Pretty straightforward. Okay, now this is interesting. On the primary, I'm generating 71K per second. You saw that as a couple of the previous charts. But the redo process is only doing 17K per second. Why is that? That implies that if the secondary is not keeping up. And if you surmise that, you surmise correctly, and we're going to tell you more. So in this high performance environment, the secondary is not keeping up with the primary. The traffic is getting across the wire in real time, 
which wasn't possible until 2016. But now, but once it got to the secondary, the redo process isn't keeping up. Let's, let's dive in a little bit more. This is a number you've seen before, getting about 200 megabytes per second across. Uh, the primary is flushing about 200 megabytes a second to its, to its log. And the secondary receives via the log transport mechanism approximately the same amount of traffic. So this, is, this just proves that the secondary or the, is receiving the data that the primary generates. And this is, again, a function of the improved, vastly improved log transport mechanism. But look at the redone bytes per second. Only 50 megabytes. Hmm. Hmm. That explains, remember near the top, we have the 71K transactions per second versus 17K? This, this is the explanation for that. The secondary, even though the data has been delivered from the primary via the log transport, the secondary is, is only able to redo 50 megabytes per second. Wow, and that's better, that's better than before, <laughs> in 2012 and 2014, but the point is, it's still a bottleneck today for high-performance workloads. Now, the truth is, folks, not too many people on the planet are generating this kind of a throughput yet, but it is a matter of time before this becomes a lot more common. And uh, let's do some math here. We're, gener we're throwing 200 megabytes across the wire. We're applying from the secondary logs to the AG databases about 50 megabytes per second. And so that's a delta, that's a differential of about 160 megabytes per second in this high throughput test uh, that, we're, that is just queuing on the secondary log. It's hardened on the secondary log, but it's waiting to be processed, waiting to be applied to the, second, to the secondary databases. And over the course of time, with this kind of rate, it doesn't take long to back up a lot of data. Um, so I hope that you see here, so the takeaways from the last few slides are log transport, yes, great. Log redo, eh, not so much. Uh, let's, let's dive in a little bit more. Oh, I'll be clear, this has failover and recovery implications. Because if, uh, you, if you were to lose the primary in this circumstance, you're in good shape in terms of not losing data. That data is hardened on the secondary log in real time. But when will that secondary be available on failover? Well, it's got to churn through everything in the recovery queue before it becomes available again. And again, most real-world applications aren't going to generate this much traffic. The recovery queue isn't going to build like this. But the goal in a highly available environment is to keep the recovery queue at or near zero. And uh, if we're maximizing the the functionality of SQL Server and throwing as much data across the wire as we can possibly generate, the recovery queue is going to grow. And uh, when that happens, again, there are failover implications. On failover, at least you don't lose any data. The data is immediately hardened on the secondary. It's not available on the secondary databases. It can't be read yet until that recovery queue is empty. Okay. So there's a, uh, let's see if I can get this GIF to work. Here we go. Let's put it over here. Those of you who may be able to see this. We have uh, CPU Zero doing a whole lot of work here, being cheered along by its constituent friendly, brotherly CPUs. And then what happens? Blue screen. Okay, that doesn't happen with availability groups. This, uh, the point of this cute little graphic is to emphasize what happens when you have a, a single a process that's bottlenecked on a single thread, and I'm going to show you more. So be very clear. We do have a single threaded process that is a bottleneck. There's no blue screening going on in AGs here, okay? All right, I want to make sure very, very clear about that. All right. So here's what's happening. The log redo process is parallel. They've done, it used to be a single threaded process from start to finish. The log traffic, the log was hardened on the secondary by, and then one thread 
was responsible for the redo process. Well, that isn't the case anymore. They have done some work. They're starting to mitigate this bottleneck that remains. And uh, the challenge is there's a thread that distributes that work to the constituent worker threads that do the redo. And that single thread in this view, as you can see, is, 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 is bottlenecked. It's pegged at 100%. And uh, again, look at the total CPU. The average of all the cores, of all the processors on this box, only 8%. So you've got that one CPU pegged, just like on that graphic I shared with you a few moments ago. Let's dive in just a little bit more. We interrogated sys.process sys here, or sys.sys processes. And uh, uh, strange name, uh, that, that the thread, the process that uh, on which it, the redo thread is bottlenecked, it's called, the command is called DB startup. And as you can see by the last wait type, it's waiting for CPU. SOS scheduler yield, scheduler yield means, hey, I'm waiting for CPU. Um, if you see this once in a while, it's not a problem. But as you saw in the previous slide, we got that, that one processor pegged at 100%. And this is eminently redoable. Uh, uh, I didn't have to work very hard at all to capture this. I worked directly with the product team when I ran into the bottleneck. I said, hey, guys, I thought log redo was parallel today. Why, am I, why are we running into this? They knew immediately what the problem was, and they're working on it. And they introduced me to some queries, and uh, these are the results. Very simple query, again, just sys process processes. And you can see um, rows 2 through 18 in the result set. Those are all parallel workers. And look at the last wait type. It's very plain, <laughs> the characterization of this wait type. They're waiting for work. They're standing around doing nothing. Um, waiting, 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 while uh, uh, the, the worker that's responsible for distributing work to them is waiting on CPU. So that's our challenge with log redo. I want to be clear again, I've mentioned this, but I want to reemphasize. Not too many workloads on the planet need this kind of work. More and more workloads uh, uh, are going to run into this, though. And in fact, the SQL one of the reasons the SQL Server team is is applying so much effort to it now is because they're okay. They're running into customers. They're finding very important customers who are running into this, and because of those pioneering customers and the great work of the product team, uh, we're going to get a fix before most of us need it. So hip hip hooray for them. All right. So what we have we talked about? We talked about we have a white paper that contains all this information. And then I started telling you a little bit about what's in the white paper. We talked about the log transport improvements in, in 2016. We talked about um, uh, the redo bottleneck. And in the middle there somewhere, we talked about the great performance you, you can get on Flash and how to expose microseconds latencies in Perfmon. Now we're going to move on to something that uh, uh, could very well be a practical, a practical use to a lot of you guys and gals out there. Um, raise your hands, folks, if you run into checkpoint issues. Well, there is a fully supported trace flag. You don't, don't, have, don't have to be on Flash. You don't have to be on availability groups. You don't have to be on SQL 2016. It's been available for any implementation of 2016, or excuse me, any implementation of SQL Server since 2005. What should I tell you more? Right, hopefully some of you have your ears perked up. Okay, this is a default behavior for checkpoint. Pretty extreme, but believe me, as a consultant to Microsoft, everywhere I went for any kind of workload uh, pushing I/O, we uh, we jumped, we slammed dirty data, dirty pages to disk during a checkpoint. And well, when you're doing that, your conventional workload, your your application workload, basically grinds to a halt. CPU can throttle way down, etc. Your your whole the, um, and in fact, what I have highlighted here is processor time. You can see during the checkpoint process, and again, this is the default behavior. We're on the, the environment you've just seen, those three 2U boxes, AGs, um, pushing across, um, in, this, in this particular test, 53,000 transactions per second. And uh, um, an average processor time was only 41%. Why? Because during checkpoint, when dirty pages are slammed to disk, your disk I.O. subsystem can be overwhelmed. Yes, even flash. It was not managed properly. 
even the great, you saw several charts earlier, the fantastic performance we were able to provide with this configuration. Well, part of the reason for that great performance is some of the tuning that we did. And, and some of that tuning included mitigating checkpoint behavior. But again, this is the default behavior. And you can see when a checkpoint happens, CPU goes down, transactions per second goes down, et cetera. Log bytes flush go down. All the important counters go down and uh, while, the, while the disk is servicing the checkpoint. And again, this is something that all of you guys are very, very, many of you are very, very likely to see in your own environments. Maybe not quite this extreme, but you see it. All right, so let's move on and let's show you, uh, let me tell you about hyphen K. It's a kind of a strange startup flag. What in the, why in the world does it start with hyphen K when everything else starts with hyphen T? Don't ask me, I don't know, but it's been around for over a decade. There we go. Had to one of that slide to work right. Again, this is the consistency that you saw in some of my earlier slides. Um, compare that to the previous slide. So let's let's roll back to that previous slide for a second. Look at this roller coaster ride. Default checkpoint behavior. Implementing this new startup trace flag that you probably have never heard of. And we get this kind of behavior. Isn't that amazing? Look at the processor time. We went from 41% in the previous slide to 78% average here. And in this test, we're getting 99,000 transactions per second. Folks, that's dynamite, almost 6 million per second. So let's uh, go to the next slide and, and look at those without reading the slide. Just basically look in the, from the left column to the right column. The, and what are we looking at here? We see that in each and every one of these instances, the average value is far higher in, with the implementation of the startup trace flag than the default behavior. And we're not going to dive into it, but if you were to look at the, the numbers in bracketed, bracketed, that's the min and the max. And uh, the range is, is the range for the default behavior is far more far wider than the relatively minimal range for the startup trace flag, hyphen K750. And by the way, what is 750? 750, the number after hyphen K represents the number of megabytes per second that you throttle the checkpoint. You're telling SQL Server, hey, I don't care how many dirty pages you have, you're, I want you to throttle, I want, I want no more than X number of megabytes per second being sent to disk. And uh, we did some experiments, and it turns out for us, 750 was the sweet spot. You could pick 512, you could pick 1024, you could pick 2 gigabytes, just as long as it's an integer, integer value representing the number of megabytes per second. And you saw on the previous two slides, that roller coaster ride, your application and your server was going on, versus the beautiful, relatively speaking, smooth performance, all by throttling your checkpoint through this fully supported trace flag that's been around for a decade. I took a, a SQL skills training immersion with Paul and Kim and uh, Glenn and Aaron and Tim and, uh, and Jonathan last year. And uh, Paul introduced this to us. And uh, okay, that's cool. And then last year I was in a lab uh, with the Microsoft Engineering Excellence Center uh, along with SQL Cat with my old pals. And they actually implemented this. It was the first time I had seen a real world implementation. And uh, it was magical, just like we, and uh, so we've started to adopt it at SanDisk, and uh, you saw the results. You're looking at the results. Pretty neat stuff. Jimmy. And again, this is something you don't, yes. Just on that, uh, I've got a question. Are there any side effects for using this trace flag? Mm. Guys, I, I am telling you this is a free lunch. This is a free lunch. The, uh, um, the only side effect would be if you, choose a value, now that you're asking, I'm thinking about it a little more, so let me qualify that a little bit. It's, it's mostly a free lunch. Um, you have to choose a value that, so you don't want your checkpoints, you know, the whole point of checkpoint, uh, one, of the, one of the points is to minimize recovery time, right? So you don't want your checkpoints falling behind and that's so that the, the, when it, the checkpoint does kick in, it takes longer and longer and longer and longer. So theoretically, for example, if I had chosen a value such as uh, 512 or 256 instead of 750 um, or whatever number, a too small a value 
will build up the dirty pages in the in the buffer pool, and and on on a on a restart or a failover, uh, you'd have a, you'd have an issue getting that it would getting that stuff to disk. It would take some time. When I mentioned 750 was a sweet spot for us, that was the value that uh, um, uh, was just was just perfect. Uh, a gigabyte, you know, if I did 1024 or 1000, uh, my uh, after the hyphen K, it was too much. It it uh it was better than the default behavior. But it still uh, impacted I/O. I didn't get that microsecond latency that you saw in earlier slides. Um, 750 was again the sweet spot. I got that microsecond latency consistently for an arbitrarily long period of time, and the it it was able to accommodate all the dirty pages I need so that uh, uh, they didn't the the buffer pool didn't queue up. The checkpoint checkpoint actually finished and quiesced until the next one kicked in. Hope that was clear. Basically, the answer is no, as long as you pick a value that doesn't, um, that, uh, that allows Checkpoint to actually finish. Now, that isn't clear. Uh, please email me, tweet me, um, call me, <laughs> whatever, and I will explain it. And I'm happy to work with anyone uh, directly if you're actually thinking about uh, implementing this environment. Quick 10 or 15 minute phone call, seriously, conference call, I'd be happy to work with you to make sure you get it right. Okay. Any other questions, Warwick? I know we're running close on time. That's right, we do, but I'll um, hold them till the end. Okay. Um, I'm going to go through, I think, three more of the lessons learned, and I'm going to do it quickly. Uh, and uh, this stuff isn't nearly as deep, so to speak, so we can do so quickly, and then we'll then we'll open up for questions. Um, firmware, folks, these aren't spinning. SSDs have, um, like any of your Net, your electronic devices need to be updated, unlike most spinning disks. Occasionally I'll get a hand who's updated firmware on a spinning disk. Most people haven't. I certainly never have. Uh, SSDs need to be updated. And by the way, the next gen of SSDs, they'll be updated. Uh, the firmware can be updated with no downtime. Bottom line here is uh, when we updated our firmware, I wasn't hitting the specs, the I.O. that I expected to get from my disks. And, uh, and I was looking around, looking around, looking around. It turns out that my Bless our little hearts. Our lab team had not updated these disks. Uh, for HP, this flash was uh, um, uh, tuned for the HP I/O controllers, and updating with the updating our disks with for their controllers gave us out, up on reboot a 20% perf improvement. It's pretty cool. Be aware uh, the is not these performance improvements can be non-trivial. Hardware validation. Well, how did I discover? that I was not hitting my specs. Well, I was validating the, my, my disks. I was running disk speed, D-I-S-K-S-P-D, which is the successor to SQL I.O. for those of you who don't know. Um, I, was, I was validating each and every one of my disks to make sure I was getting the results that I needed, and I wasn't, and I was frustrated. And I dug around and did some interrogation, and uh, that's how we figured it out. Folks, you cannot put a, a handful of flash or I/O memory cards, or your, or NVMe cards, or a big fancy million-dollar SAN to production without validating it. It's long been a best practice. Do so. Uh, this isn't new for Flash. This is a long-time best practice. And do it before you flip that production bit. It's a lot higher, a lot easier to find things and fix things uh, before you go to production. And a lot of my customers, as a consultant and now as a SAN disk engineer, have learned the hard way. Way. All right, backup options. One of the one of our tricks, uh, secrets for success, and this is the last thing we'll talk about before we um, move on uh, to questions. There's one more slide is accompanying this. Is um, backup. Uh, this is uh, we did our testing in order to try to emulate a real world implementation, and to do that, uh, you've got to do backups. In our case, we did backups every five minutes. Um, log backups every five minutes. And uh, normally, um, when I'm doing backup, I'm just trying to get that backup done as quickly as I possibly can, uh, maximizing backup perf. But in our case, because I'm doing, I'm trying to emulate a real-world implementation, we have to worry about application perf. And, uh, and my goal is to maintain that microsecond latencies with no dips in performance, uh, which we were able to achieve. How did we do this? Well, normally. As I said, I slam that back up across the wire as fast as I can. Multiple across the wire, uh, 
wherever the backup happens to reside. Uh, multiple disk devices, I manipulate max transfer size, and I manipulate buffer count from the defaults. So here's what we did for our data and log files. Uh, I only used, and by the way, the, those of you who may not know about this null device, this is a, a way to test your backup performance, and, and um, you're backing up, reading from disk as fast as you can, and sending that stuff to the ether. You're not dependent on uh, the complication of your, of your, your, your destination uh, backup target to complicate performance. This allows you to, to measure using the null device to measure maximum backup performance. And just like you can with physical devices, you can use multiple devices. You can see here I ratcheted down the uh, max transfer size from my normal 4 megs to, um, to 64K, I, uh, and I reduced buffer count as well. For the log, I had to be even more uh, uh, gentle. I uh, only used one device, uh, same max transfer size of 64K, and used only 16 buffer counts. And uh, you too, gentlemen, ladies, can uh, geeks, can uh, tune your own backups. And this is independent of AGs, it's independent of SQL Server 2016. These are options that have been available just for us in SQL Server since the beginning of my career, way back in the 20th century. Okay, with that, there are a handful of other lessons learned. They'll be available on the on the deck. I hope um, you have enjoyed the dive into the deep dive into some of the internals, as well as some of the lessons, other lessons learned and best practices. And with that work, uh, it's 17 after by my watch. Let's turn it over to questions. Okay, so. Does RAID level have any performance implication when using flash drives? Oh, absolutely. The, the same, the same um, math applies to flash RAID as it does to spinning media RAID. Um, if there is more to that question that you're asking, let me know. But for example, uh, initially we tried RAID 5 with these in order, you know, if we can get a buy with RAID 5 using fewer disks rather than RAID 10, uh, we're going to do that. Okay, so, but in our case, uh, to achieve the kind of performance that we got, and I, uh, folks, I hope you admit, you have to acknowledge this was fantastic performance, and I'm not just saying that because it's my flash. Me and my team worked pretty hard on, on achieving this kind of, this high, low latency, high throughput performance that was consistent. And uh, one of the ways we did that was by uh, manipulating RAID level. We chose to go with 6 disk RAID 10 um, instead of a 6 disk RAID 5, for example, because it was it gave us the performance that we needed. And the log, for example, uh, we tried to get by with only a pair of logs, uh, a mirrored pair for the logs, which is often enough, in uh, even on spinning media, to support the sequential writes that, m that many applications require um, to a, for, a low, for a low latency log. But in our case, we were throwing so much throughput at it to, again, the log traffic was about 200 megabytes per second. We had to throw um, uh, uh, another another pair of disks at the log. So we have a four disk grade 10. And, and um, uh, similar things apply. And for a lot of applications, let me say one more thing and I'll move on. A lot of applications, you're not going to need this kind of throughput. And it's not unlikely, for example, if you're using IO memory or some other PCIe flash, uh, you can get by with a, with, a, with a mirrored pair. Or depending on your availability needs, you may not even use RAID at all. You'll just use a single disk and, and, and have some other failover mechanism in case that, that, uh, that SSD were to fail or that flash were to fail. Hope that was a good answer. Again, ping me directly if you have any other questions and you need more information. Okay, so following, following on from that, so if I've got limited budget and I wanted to set up or choose appropriate disk, if I set up and had uh, my log and TempDB on flash drives and data on non-flash okay. drives, is that my best option? Oh, that, boy, that's, um, that's a good question, <laughs> but it's, it's a, uh, not easy to answer because um, it really does depend. I'm sorry, I don't mean to parrot Kimberly Tripp, um, but I can't help it sometimes. Um, so let me think if I can give you a an answer. Do me a favor and, and ask the last part of the question really quickly, please. Okay, so... Read the last part of the question. So having my, is it best for me to have my log and tempdb on flash drives and my data files on non-flash drives? Okay, I'm, I'm going to answer it this way. Um, it could be, but you might be better off if uh, putting your data on flash 
and putting your log on a mirrored pair, your, da your data and TimDB on Flash, and putting your, your application log on a mirrored pair. Look, the log, log requires sequential I.O. Uh, and the log is eminently sensitive to, to latency values. It's, it has some hard-coded throughput limits, and I, I have them in this deck somewhere. I don't know them offhand. Um, in terms of outstanding I.O. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and Q, uh, outstanding Q depth. And if you can mitigate that, and in most applications, most real-world applications are, don't generate, you can get a mil, a mega, 100 megabytes per second of sequential I.O. on a mirrored pair. You know, you want a mirrored pair for availability, obviously, in case one of the disks, in case one of the disks fails. And if your application produces less than 100 mega, megabytes per second, uh, that means a mirrored pair of conventional media can handle that, and you might be in better shape putting your both your uh, uh, data and TMTB on your flash. Okay, but it really does depend on your I/O needs. So measure your I/O needs and uh, discriminate between what your application, your data files need, and what your log file needs. Okay, and it's possible, folks. Uh, depending again, depending on your application, depending on I/O throughput, etc., that um, uh, putting every if it fits, putting everything on a flash uh, is, the, is the best answer. And that's that's the ideal world, right? We want all of our multi-terabyte databases to live on Flash, and that's where we're going. We're going. Uh, remember, remember the stories, decisions you make today, you're going to live with for a few years. So uh, think, think well. Think about moving CPU, um, moving the bottleneck off of off of spinning media to the CPU. And I didn't emphasize it in this presentation, but if you can, for example, cons consolidate C two or more SQL Server instances onto one server uh, and, and, uh, and uh, service, service those applications using Flash instead of spinning media, you're leveraging, you're likely to leverage more CPU and pay far, 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 hundreds of thousands, thousands of dollars less in licensing costs. So I segued a little bit from the question about your architectural placement, uh, but the point is um, it's important to consider Flash for all of your storage needs. And, and and not be it not not to be an either or, but to be just flash when possible, even on big, um, even for big databases. Okay, work next. Okay, so one of one of the concerns about SSD is their short lifespan. Is that a myth? It is a myth, and I'm not saying that because I work for a flash company. Uh, the good old back in the good old days when I was running SQL Cat Lab, uh, it was possible to burn out in flash. It, it, it isn't the the warranties are typically with our OEMs or for the life of the server. All flash on any any data sheet from any competitor, you'll find drive writes per day. You'll also find an Uber number, uncorrected bit error rate. Um, it is really it's not impossible, and and you can buy flash. You know, there's uh, uh, for there are for the disks we use here, where HP is write intensive uh, brand. You can pay a little bit less for flash that doesn't require as many writes. Uh, to, for archive data, web application data, things like that. Um, uh, but even even for these low write rated SSDs, uh, you're talking the the min of the the smallest guarantee that I've seen recently is one drive write per day for four terabyte disks, four terabyte SSDs. How many of us, even for our high write applications, will write four terabytes a day to a single disk? Are we deleting and writing new data? So even in the in the uh, le the the SSDs that aren't marked as write intensive, we're not going to wear them out. Okay, and that's that's not just I'm not ask, telling you to go down to your local electronics store and buy that that consumer flash for your enterprises, but for enterprise quality flash, you're not going to wear it out in any in a for, in all but the most extreme circumstances. Okay. All right. Next. So, um, question around the trace flag. Mm. Why, ha why has this trace flag not been promoted? We don't know. When I heard about it, you know, being being a high performance guy for all of my career, basically, uh, when I heard about it in Paul's class, I smiled and nodded, marked it down, you know, because you know Paul, will, you know, in SQL skills, he will you'll hear a lot of really cool stuff. But it wasn't until I saw it implemented. With along with my friends at the SQL Cat team in a lab last last January, less than a year ago, that I saw how magical it was, 
um, when I posted this to the MCM DL, uh, when the paper was first published, I got a couple of uh, feedbacks from people. Wow, what, what, what? Just like that, the questioner. Where, where has this been all my life? Um, <laughs> and uh, so we're implementing it in all of our implementations now and doing our best to evangelize it. And folks, that's when, again, one of the secrets of this paper. I wrote it not just to advertise, oh, look what SanDisk Flash can do, and look what SQL 26 King can do. Yes, both awesome. But also I introduced, I made it a point uh, to push the internals information out, the best practices and lessons learned. And that's, uh, that's as valuable an outcome of the paper as anything, I think. So I invite you to check it out for yourselves. Good question. All right, so last question, unless anybody else has some more questions they want to post quickly. Uh, I hear around two years ago, some spinning disks still outperform SSDs on sequential writes. Is this still the case, specifically since logs are sequential? Ah. Well, I've mentioned it. I've been candid with you um, um, that uh, during a previous application, I mentioned that you might be better off putting your log, your application log, on a mirrored pair of conventional media and, uh, and putting your application data on Flash instead. Um, no question about it. Conventional spinning media do a darn good job of pure sequential I.O. Now, it's got to be pure if you start uh, putting, for example, five application logs, you know, on, on your, on your, on your uh, mirrored pair. Well, then you're turning your, 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 the cumulative effect is to turn that into random I.O. Okay, but for a single application database log file on, this, on, on spinning media, you, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape except for all all but the most high-performing uh, applications. Now, having said that, today's Flash is bigger, better, faster than ever, and um, many of our products exceed um, the capabilities of conventional media. For example, if we were to go back uh, in this deck to a, the, uh, the slide, I call it the, the, the slide where I apologize for it sounding like an ad, the stars of the show, these guys do 500 megabytes per second. Oh, 500 megabytes a second. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to look to make sure I don't fib and mis misrepresent anything. I can find the slide pretty quickly. There it is. So these particular SSDs, which are not the biggest, best, fastest we have, um, they're doing sequential writes of 580 megabytes per second. The most high-performance spinning media you're going to get 200 megabytes per second. So one of these disks is going to is is twice as performant as the spec for a conventional media. So that answers your question. I uh, I give spinning media the credit that it's due, but contemporary flash is bigger, better, faster than ever for all of your I/O needs. Okay. Do we have time for another one, or is that it? I think that's it. We've got uh, no more questions uh, waiting. So thank you, Jimmy, for coming along today and presenting to us. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we will be back again next month. Uh, we will be back to our normal time, and so we'll be back on again in three weeks' time. So thank you once again. Everybody have a uh, great afternoon, great evening, and I look forward to seeing you all in a month's time. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone.